all this is just a strange light. It was just a single light from what it looked like, but it was moving across the sky. And it was, it, it didn't have enough lights to be an airplane. And it was definitely not a helicopter. And if it was even a military helicopter, there was no way that it was that high up and it was that small with that one light. And we just kind of watched it and it just kind of traveled across the sky. And then all of a sudden, it faded out. Hmm. Just out of nowhere. Like, and there were no, no clouds, no trees to block it. It just kind of just faded out. What it do you think? Odd. It could have, like, for as far as I know, it could have been a meteorite going through the atmosphere. It, it could have been something simple like that. You know, but figure it would moved a lot faster than the rate it was moving across the sky. Yeah. So who knows? But that's not, I don't even really could say that I, I think aliens truly exist. I want to say they do. I haven't seen enough proof. I think there's other things in the sky possibly maybe to do with maybe the energy that people put out and the energy that, you know, circulates through the world, whether it be good energy or bad energy. But like I said, it's, there's many variables and there's many possible realms that could be explored that could explain a lot of different things. Yeah, in this interview, it really opened my eyes to a theory or thoughts that I didn't even, I haven't even thought about before that could be yeah. possible. So I, I think when people actually listen to this interview later on that they're going to be like, whoa, okay, I can see his point of view and I can see where he's coming from, you know, because yeah. he does, he does make some good, you know, points and the valid points at that, you know? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, like I said, like a lot of y'all will hear in the interview, he, there, there's some sincerity in his voice and there's some life experiences in his voice. And, you know, there's, there's bits and pieces of it that, I would honestly say resonated with me very clearly and very loudly. It was almost, I would say it was definitely <clears throat> uplifting and comforting to hear somebody on, speak along the lines of the ideas that I, I kind of hold to myself and, you know, feel kind of excommunicated amongst most people because of, you know, what things that I believe in of how the world and the universe operates, you know, what we see in the skies at any point, can be confusing, enlightening, uh, as, as well as captivating. So um, we decided here at Theories of the Third Kind to, to bring in a leading and renowned expert uh, in the field of inconclusive, unidentified sightings. Uh, we did a live interview and a live recording with uh, Mr. Jeffrey Woolwine earlier this week and was enticed with the perspectives and theories that he brought, brought along with him. So now uh, we bring to you Jeff Woolwine. Welcome to Theories of the Third Kind. Today we have a very special guest joining us today. He is the former Ancient Aliens TV host for Tucson, Arizona, as well as the leading UFO investigator in Phoenix, Arizona. He runs a Facebook live show called Petroglyphs in the Sky. I would call him the, uh, the king of the petroglyphs and one of the best UFO hunters in the United States. Please give a nice insertion welcome to our special guest, Jeff Woolwine. Hi, man. <laughs> Thank hey. you. That's very nice to say. I, I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Hey, not a problem. Thank you for coming on the show today and allowing us to share your story with our listeners. So, Jeff, uh, could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background? Well, let's see. Um, I'm a native of Phoenix, Arizona. I was born and raised here. And, uh, um, you know, even when I was a kid, I was living here in this desert. Uh, I was seeing, you know, lights in the sky, objects, objects in the sky, you know, but, you know, during a kid, you know, being a kid, you just, uh, you just don't pay no mind, you know, you, you go off and you just forget about it. But later growing up, you know, I, I was seeing more and more of them. And so this has been a, a lifetime journey with me. And, uh, you know, it just, it didn't take into effect until about, uh, oh, probably around 2001. Um, I had uh, lived in New York, uh, about 150 miles away from New York City, and uh, I, matter of fact, I uh, I saw the the twin towers uh, before they fall, and uh, after, you know, uh, living 150 miles away uh, from New York City, I could see the smoke. But uh, you know, during what was really fascinating, what really was was uh, interesting was during the 9-11 event of 2001, 
there was a no-fly zone in effect for about five days. And, uh, you know, nothing was in the sky. And, uh, you know, prior to this, you know, I did, uh, I did see a light uh, in Mesa, uh, I believe probably uh, 1994, uh, 95, give or take. And, uh, you know, I, I missed uh, the 1997 uh, Phoenix light spread. But I did see some things in Phoenix while I was there before I went to New York. But what really kicked in was during the no-fly zone in upstate New York, uh, my friend, uh, my son and his friend was outside playing. And uh, he comes running up because, you know, I've always taught my son, you know, he was he was just a toddler at the time. I was like, you know, UFOs are here. I've been seeing stuff. You know, if you ever see anything strange, you know, come and get me, you know, for sure. And so one day he, him and his friend was out there playing and he come right into the window and he's like, dad, a UFO. So I go running out there and, and sure enough, I go looking up and there's four silver spheres connected together. And the only way I can expl expl explain this and describe this is, is, you know, the kids jumping jacks, you know, on, on yeah. the, the jumping jacks, right. That's basically mm -hmm. how it kind of looked. And it was going counterclockwise and it was about give or take a thousand feet uh, up in the, up in the sky there. And uh, my friend, uh, we were sitting there watching it. And my, and my son's friend was like, Oh, that's probably an airplane or something. And I'm like, no, that is not an airplane. This thing is crazy. This is going over our heads. It's low. We can see this is this is something, you know. And as it went over our heads, it, it went over some trees uh, towards this park. And then it, something caught my eye to the far right. And I looked up and I saw another silver sphere. And it had a red tail and a, and a red tip. And it seemed to like head towards these jacks well the trees got in the way and we we're all baffled and i was like i was telling the kids man don't ever forget about what you saw i said i've been around this land for many years man i've never seen anything like that you know i used to walk the kids back and forth to school and i always make sure that they remembered that sighting because it was very significant and uh you know i wanted them to learn as they were growing up that yes something is here man and something something has, and it's all always been here you know so going into this you know like i said before i've seen ufos before i went to new york but after that you know bam that that just made me hit it you know there is something here and i'm gonna get to the bottom of it and i'm thinking to myself what am i doing in new york i'm from phoenix arizona that is one of the hot spots of ufo activity what the hell am i doing in new york yeah <laughs> so <laughs> in 2000 in 2004, I headed back to Phoenix. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that there was a guy, he was filming the lights, making the news out here in Phoenix um, on the west side of, um, I'm, excuse me, uh, the east side of Phoenix. And uh, he was catching lights on, on a regular basis. So I knew that the lights were attracted to the east side for some reason in that area. And uh, while I was like uh, living in this apartment, I was getting my son ready for school and uh, the news, the, the following night, the news helicopter out here in Phoenix happened to catch some lights in the exa exact same spot of where the Phoenix lights uh, happened at back in 1997. This was uh, uh, 2004. And uh, so it's it the exact same spot on the west side. Now I knew that they were you know, seeing that they captured the lights on the west side but this guy on the news, he was catching them more on the east side. So, I, you know, I wanted to, I was like, this is it. These lights are back. I'm going to go chase them down. I'm going to go find out what's going on. Well, prior to this, I had seen a, uh, a news special, uh, like a special on one of the public access out here. And uh, there was a Native American, and he was out there on South Mountain. Now, South Mountain is is one of the many mountains we have around here in Phoenix, Arizona. and uh, But it seems to be the heart of the city here. And um, so he was up there, and he, he was talking about petroglyphs. And uh, there were some people there around him, and, and the guy was looking, and the guy asked, asked uh, his name was Jim. Or, uh, yeah, Jim. He, he asked him, hey, you know, uh, this petroglyph looks like uh, there was that, you know, there's something above his head. And... Uh, 
he turned right around and said, yes. He's like, that is some of the interpretations here is that our ancestors saw and recorded things in the sky. Well, I was like, wait a minute, hold the phone, a light bulb over the head. Yeah, wait a minute here. We've got strange lights in the sky here in Phoenix, Arizona. Now we have strange carvings on the rocks out here describing the same thing. There's got to be a connection. Wow. So in 2004, in 2004, I moved um, to, the, uh, to the east side of Phoenix. And I knew the direction to look, you know, because I knew kind of, uh, I had a pretty good idea on where to, you know, spot these lights, you know, and have my camera ready. I was, uh, you know, so I moved out there and, uh, you know, it didn't take, take this long in the summer of 2004. Um, I was sitting out there on my, pa- uh, on my, uh, my patio uh, just, bef- just uh, after sunset. And lo and behold, two white lights appeared about three or four miles ahead of us. And they were going west. They were heading towards South Mountain. I jumped on the camera. This is the very first time I'm filming these things. You know, I'm shaking all over the place. I can't believe it. We've got the lights in front of us. They're going west. This is great. There was another light to the east of them, to the right of them. And that was just stationary. Well, these lights are going west, and all of a sudden, they disappear. Two more lights would appear going west towards South Mountain. Two more lights appeared going west towards South Mountain. And finally, that light on the east side disappeared, just faded out. And I was like, wow, holy cow, man, that was something. I finally got something on tape, man. This is awesome. You know? So the next few nights, my son and I went out to the same balcony. We didn't see anything. And I was like, you know what? There's got to be a better place to watch. So me and my son, we took off and I found a school. I found Mesa Community College. And there was a a set of bleachers out there for the football games. Well, I climbed up on those bleachers and, and lo and behold, when I got up on the top, I could see all of Phoenix. No trees was in the way, no buildings, no mountains. It was a perfect skyline. And I was like, this is where I'm sitting. I'm sitting right here, and I'm going to watch these lights because this is the direction the lights were going, and I'm following them. I'm basically following these lights, and lo and behold, where did it end up at? It, it I ended up on the east side of South Mountain. Well, the whole summer of 2004, these lights are appearing right in front of us about five to six miles away. Big orange amber lights, formations, sometimes lightning bolts, sometimes going across, sometimes together. We have windy nights. The, it's really windy, but the lights are still there. Information, not moving. They're there. They disappear. They come back. I mean, it was great. I must have got about four to 500 sightings that, that summer. It was wow. crazy. And uh, so I'm calling the news, right? And it's always, it's always in the same spot. So I never saw the lights where I originally saw that. It was like, they wanted me to follow them. You know, they wanted me to see them. They wanted me to follow. So I did. This is where I ended up at. And they were always right in front of us the whole summer. And it was kind of cool too, because, you know, uh, during the, during the, uh, uh, the school football field, or football games, we'd have hundreds and hundreds of, of people in the football stands watching the football game, but yet my camera is faced towards <laughs> South Mountain, not even paying attention to the game. And I've had people coming up to me, dude, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? And so I'm showing them replays. I'm like, you see these lights? I said, I'm filming these lights right out here. You know, there was sometimes, uh, there was one night when the cops were called on us. We had like four or five cops come up on the bleachers one night because we're out there by ourselves. It's like 1030 at night, you know, there's, there's uh, security cameras from the school watching this. I'm sitting, matter of fact, I'm sitting right under a security camera, you know, so you know security's watching us. So the yeah. cops came up to us one day, one night. They're asking us, hey, what are you doing? So I had to show them. I was like, dude, I'm showing lights out here. And by the time we were all done and finished, the cops were leaving and they were saying to each other, wow, did you see those lights? Those lights were neat. That is something, you know? So it was really cool. So the whole summer, I'm, I'm calling the news. I'm calling the news. And I'm saying, hey, you know, 
is anybody else reporting these lights? Because I'm filming them, man, almost every night out here. Is anybody else seeing them? Because they're right there. You know, well, it took the news about maybe a month to get back with me. And finally, when they did, I ended up doing about three to four news episodes that whole summer. I did Channel 3, Channel 5, Channel 15, Channel 12. I did them all here. And at the, the end result, the end result was that we're seeing flares in Tucson, 150 miles away. Now, this is crazy because anybody who has analyzed these videos and has seen these videos are aware, and you can tell that these lights are not 150 miles away. They are right here in the heart of the city of Phoenix, right there off the east side of South Mountain. Now, also flares, you know, I've studied flares, I've studied balloons, I've studied drones, I've studied anything, everything man-made in the sky. I have studied and watched and recognized, so I learn, you know, what I'm looking at in the sky, so I don't make the mistake. If, if I'm calling that a UFO, man, that's a UFO, bro. You know, I'm, I know what drones look like, I know what balloons look like, and I understand what flares look like. Flares, it's really simple. You see airplanes. You always see airplanes. You see the anti-collision lights, the blinking lights, dropping these flares out. Okay, matter of fact, one of the news uh, stories was um, over there at Davis Muffin Air Force Base in Tucson, and they videotaped flares. And you can actually see the flares being jettisoned out of the aircraft, and you can see the smoke. It's illumination flares. It, that means it lights up the sky. It lights up the ground. It's made, its purpose is to light things up. And what is it, what did it does? It lit up the smoke. And the flares are small, they're tiny, and, and, and uh, they don't last that long. But these orbs I'm filming out here in 2004 were huge, big, orange, amber lights, no smoke. They sat in formation. Okay, they didn't drift away from each other. Even like I said before, it was windy nights, but these lights were sitting motionless in the sky. Okay, so this was not flare. Though I did have, there were airplanes. Let me get to this. There were airplanes monitoring this situation. And uh, it was kind of interesting too. These little white Cessna, okay, were hanging up in the sky about 2,000 feet, there was two white airplanes, right? Now, when these lights appeared in this certain spot that I'm going to go on to here in a few minutes on the reason why these lights are, are attracted to this spot, when these lights appeared in that spot, these airplanes would zoom in after them. I mean, full force, buddy. Here they come. Those airplanes are zooming after them. Wow. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, yes, yeah, somebody's, somebody's watching this. Someone's monitoring this. I'm getting this all on film, you know? And so they want to know what's going on. You know, that was not the case as I learned throughout the months that I was watching these things, what was really going on. Because when these airplanes came in after these lights, these lights would disappear whenever the airplanes got within a mile radius. As soon as these airplanes came in, those lights disappeared. Those airplanes came in and they circled. They circled in that area for about five minutes. And after they thought, you know, everything was cool, those airplanes went back high up in the sky, started circling, and here come the lights. It was a cat and mouse game the whole summer of 2004. The lights would come in, here comes these airplanes, boom, boom, boom. So you... and, and they're not there. They're not there to watch them. They're not there to see what's going on. They're there to get them out of the area. They are chasing them away. So okay, why do you now, think the lights are there in the first? Do you think they have a connection with the petroglyphs, the lights themselves? Well, we'll get to that here in a minute. You know, an, an hour show just isn't covering it. You know, we need about two or three hours, maybe a full day on actually what's really going on here. But uh, it, to make everything, you know, to, to narrow it down, to shorten this stuff, um, for the reason why they're in that area is because there's a power plant in that area, right there where these lights are hanging out at. Now this power plant is bored down into a fault line. Now this fault line created South Mountain. So these things are attracted to energy. They're following the sun, they're following the energy, they're following 
the fault line, okay? And over the years, monitoring these things, understanding the petroglyphs, understanding the sun, understanding the, these, these, uh, these things in the sky, they are following the sun. They are tracking the sun through the fault lines of the earth, through the season. Okay, now those of you who have, been, who have been following me here on Facebook for the past eight, nine months knows that I've been getting some crazy stuff out here. I was filming some really neat sightings. Boy, these things were here. Now, after the sun, we just had this summer solstice, and now they're gone. They went, the sun has moved, and they have changed. They have gone somewhere else because this is the sun is in line with an, an, another energy spot, another fault line. And this is the reason why they're here. Now, as soon as we have another equinox, when this equinox comes rolling, rolling around and this uh, solstice comes rolling around, they'll be back. They will be back here. But unfortunately, you know, I won't be living here at the time. I, I'm scheduled to be moving out of this area in the next couple months, and that's going to be sad. So, uh, But I'm still out here watching. I'm still waiting. I still haven't seen anything. But the only explanation is they're following the sun. We had the solstice. They're gone. They're somewhere else now. So the whole summer of 2004, you know, they're telling me I'm seeing flares. I'm like, dude, you're crazy. These things are here, man. You know, and then I remembered, hey, you know, I saw an Indian on, on, a, on a TV show a few months ago before I, I moved here. He's doing tours on South Mountain. You know, let's call this guy up and see if he can, you know, see if he'll take me on a tour, teach me the glyphs. I called him up. And uh, it's like, hey, you know, I saw you on, on Channel 8 a few months ago. You're talking about petroglyphs. I didn't tell him who, who I was, who I was, what I was doing. You know, I didn't mention them that, you know, I've been on the news a few times, you know, already, you know, talking about these Phoenix lights. And uh, he's like, yeah, sure, you know, come on up. So we went up on South Mountain and we spent about two and a half, maybe three hours on South Mountain. And he went over some crazy things, in my opinion, uh, at that time you know, that I really didn't understand <laughs> until, you know, I witnessed it for myself. And he was telling me that there's spirals. There's spirals out here on South Mountain, all right? And these are doorways, all right? He was explaining to me that these are doorways for the spirits. Now, he's not calling them UFOs. He's not calling them crafts. He's not saying technology. He's not saying Alpha Centauri. He is saying spirits, okay? He is saying that this is a doorway for the spirits to come in and out to the underworld. And one of the, uh, one of the informations here, one of the, the legends and the stories and the legends here on, in Phoenix, Arizona, when the Ho'okams, when the Ho'okams, they were the first Indians. Now, Ho'okam is a Pima word for the people who are gone, the people who are missing, because we don't know what happened to these people. They reigned here for a thousand years. And everything was fine until one day they just simply vanished with no trace. Now, the archaeologist wants us to believe, well, they just simply vanished somewhere else because it got hot. No. that is. Not, if that was the case, where did we go? We don't see any evidence on where they went. But the evidence on where they went lies within the, well, lies within the petroglyphs carved on the mountains here. History carved in stone. Prehistoric photographs, if you will. They didn't have video cameras back then. They had stone boulders to record what was happening and to remember. To, it was a prehistoric photograph. And the petroglyphs say that these things, that these Phoenix lights, that the, the other things that we'll get into later uh, on the show, picked these, these people up and carried them off uh, into the sky, never to return. And this is the oral tradition. The oral tradition on some of the Native American ancestors, because I, I've talked to a, a few other shaman and some medicine men out here. Some of them do not want to talk to me about this because they understand. They tell you, we're in the fourth world. We're getting ready to enter the fifth. This is the reason why these things are coming back, because every time the world changes, every time the world changes, man needs these things once again to survive. And that's exactly what had happened to the Holocom. The Holocom stories say, when the, when the Hohokam first arrived here, they didn't know how to live here. Now, it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't a desert at that time. There's evidence of waterfalls on the mountain, and there's evidence, evidence that there was clearly a lot of water here. It was, it was more like a tropical-like landscape. Okay, so it wasn't hot and desolated and dried up, but they didn't know how to live. So these things came up out of the sand world 
and they lost their tails because they, they, they like to call them lizard men. And they lost their tails to look like everybody else. And they taught these people how to survive, how to live on the land. And there's a lot of myths in, in Indian legend, especially with the Hopis. You know, the Hopis say that Spider Woman, you know, taught the Hopis how to weave their baskets by making the spider web in the sky. Now, this is significant because, you know, I videotaped something that resembles a, a spider entity. Now, going into this, I, I found out that these things actually actually has a lot to do with things that we read in like biblical scrolls, the Sumerian texts. I mean, this goes way back. I mean, this this goes way, way back. It's really neat because, you know, if you take religion, just take religion out of the Bible. Let's just kick that to the curb. And let's look at the Bible as, as a type of history book of the world. And once you do that, Everything will make sense. Everything falls into place on what these beings are, why there's giants, giants, giants carved on the mountains out here on South Mountain. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know there was absolutely. giants carved. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's evidence here in Phoenix, Arizona of the giants. Now, this is stuff that the archaeologist isn't talking about. All right. Now, <laughs> this, is, this is stuff that I uh totally discovered by myself and then later later i verified everything i was finding for the first year i'm doing this i'm hiking the mountain i'm learning the petroglyphs i'm learning the spirits i'm learning all this stuff and i'm doing radio shows such as this one i'm doing tv shows i'm doing cable shows and i'm talking about this stuff i'm showing photographs look that's a tomb right there you know but i really didn't have anything really backing me up until until I went to the Phoenix downtown public library and I went to the government department and I asked them, could you, could you please just give me anything and everything you have on South mountain? Lo and behold, they came out with a folder. It was about five to six inches thick. And as soon as I opened up that folder, boom, there it was all the information that I had discovered a year before was verified, verified by the first park ranger of South mountain named Charles Holbrook. Now, Charles Holberg, he knew tombs were here. He understood about the about the uh, uh, the Native American myths, legends, and things like that. He understood about the tomb. You know, and he, uh, his son wrote a book about Charles Holberg and what he did on South Mountain. There's stuff in the archives out here um, that talk about Holberg and how he saved a lot of petroglyphs out here. He saved the tombs. Okay, he actually did he did tours out here. And uh, explaining, he told people, look, this is what's here, you know, and some of it, some of it, it kind of backfired on him because there was some uh, archaeology, uh, archaeologist sites out here that after he discovered it and let the city of Phoenix know about something that was on this hill, vandals, vandals came in and, and destroyed it all and dug it up and wasted it. And uh, that's, that's a whole new story in itself. But, you know, after but he knew he handed out flyers talking about you know the spirits of the earth and sky and he talked about the tombs and the hokongs and what happened to these people you know and um after his death they buried all his information to the even to this day the archaeologist does not acknowledge that he was here that there that what he had done they covered all his information up. Sure, they erected a, uh, a uh, uh, because he had a lookout tower out here and he looked out for the tomb robbers. You know, that's still out there on South Mountain and they dedicated to the, they dedicated that to him. And they also dedicated a trail, Holberg Trail. But that's about it, man. That's about all you'll know about Charles Holberg, you know, until I came around and uncovered the real history of Phoenix era, Arizona the lost history of Phoenix that people don't talk about anymore and hasn't for the last 80 years because nobody has known about this information. Do you think, now you said earlier that they were attract, you believe they're attracted, the lights were uh, attracted to the power plants and also that they followed the sun. Do you think that these lights are beings or entities 
are feeding off of the energy coming from the power plants or the sun itself, and that's why they are following the sun or staying around the power plants? Or well, is that a... A... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, here's the, here's the thing. So the whole comp, they were smart people. They didn't live that long, but they were smart people. They were sky watchers, all right? They watched the sun. They watched the sky. They watched for these spirits. Uh, they performed sacrifice on South Mountain. South Mountain was a holy mountain, and uh, it still is. Uh, matter of fact, the original name of South Mountain was Mount Sapoa, Mountain of Mercy. And uh, all tribes from all over the nations used to gather here in Phoenix, Arizona, for trade, worship, and, uh, and just to watch the spirits. And uh, this went on for the longest time. And what they did is they knew when these spirits were going to be here and they, with the, by following the sun and how they follow the sun, how they track the equinox and the solstice through the seasons is they would pick a boulder or a stone slab, a huge stone slab, and they'd carve, they, they would carve spirals on it. And they, they would put a big slab, stone slab on top. Now, during the equinox and solstice, when the sun would come around, it would cast this shadow, piercing, piercing the spiral that's carved on that, or would go up along the crack and then into the stone, meaning that the doorway, that these spirits live within the mountain here, and this is the doorway. So when you go back to it, they, they, they understood that this was, you know, uh, a living being, if you will. So the petroglyphs, they, they say that, that uh, these beings in the sky, they say that they shape shift, they're shape shifters, and they are. And, and I've seen and filmed many of these entities, shape shifting, changing colors, things like that. And the petroglyphs describe this. Okay, so when we look at this lizard man carved out here, we see a stick figure guy, if you will, but he's got this hey, circle Jeff. belly. Hey, Jeff, real quick, uh, before we start getting into like what's on the, the what, can you explain to everybody who isn't a, a follower of yours and those who are new to our podcast as well as new to your theory exactly what a petroglyph is? So that way they can be caught up to speed so they have a better understanding of what you're about to delve into. Sure. Um, petroglyph is an Indian word for basically rock drawing, rock carving. So the carvings uh, carved by the first Native Americans, um, you know, hundreds and possibly close to a, over a thousand years ago. That's basically what it is. We have pictographs, which are paintings. You know, we have we have petroglyphs, which are you know carvings. We have hieroglyphics, which is in Egypt. And that's a totally different art in itself. But right now, what we're dealing with is petroglyphs, which is uh, rock carving. Now, unfortunately, we just we can't carbon date. There's no way to carbon date these carvings. But uh, we can get a pretty good estimate on when these uh, these uh, holocons were here through the pottery shards, through the pottery shards left on the mountains here. They can carbon date that. And, and a lot of these shards here, they don't even match the Arizona dirt. A lot of them match, uh, you know, California, Mexico, Colorado, uh, Utah, uh, in parts and places like that. So, so yeah, that's basically what a, what a petroglyph is. So when when we're looking at this petroglyph and it's got this depiction of this circle, this this depiction of this guy with this belly, this round circle belly, it's it's growing arms and legs. Okay, so it. I believe that the circle in its belly is the orb that a lot of people are filming in the skies today. When we, when you see a lot of these real UFOs, not CGI crafts, not CGI little green men and aliens and blah, 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 but real authentic videos, UFO film of these orbs and such as the Phoenix lights, okay? So what is describing is first we see the orb, and then the orb morphs into a man. He's morphing into a human, or he's morphing into what looks like a, a, a dog. He's morphing on what looks like maybe a serpent, Quetzalcoatl, okay? This is the type of things that we're dealing with here. Uh, sure, why not? I get it. There might be spaceships, little green guys, Malpha Centauri. There might be crafts, technology, whatnot, blah, blah, I think. But what the majority of the public 
the good stuff, not the fake stuff, but what the good stuff is depicting is showing what we're really seeing in the skies are living entities, are living beings. The Indians call them spirits, and I believe this because when I was watching South Mountain, because, you know, after 2004, they're telling me I'm seeing flares. I'm like, dude, no way. Okay, I'm studying this. I'm studying this. And what? where do these things hang out at is mountains. Why mountains? Why South Mountain? It's because it was made by a fault line. Okay, and this is the reason why that power plant was on the east side there, burrowed down into this fault line to generate our lights, to generate our electricity here in Phoenix. It's just one major one that we have out here. Okay, okay. now yeah. when, when I found the map, go ahead. Well, yeah, so so real quick, just, just before you move on, because I, <clears throat> I, I just want to clarify for, you know, not just for myself, but for, uh, for, the, for the listeners as well, you know, so what so what are you saying exactly what do you believe is a, what a ufo actually is to you because it sounds like to me you're not uh, you're not a strong believer in the actual like alien theory uh when it comes to these ufos it sounds more like you're talking more of a spirit and almost in a sound in a spiritual sense right i think you know there's there's like less credible evidence of little green guys and spaceships and abductions and blah blah, blah you know then there is on actual real footage of orbs in the sky, flying snakes, flying creatures, okay? This is what we're dealing with here. I have not once yet seen a credible spaceship video, okay? It's all been computer generated. Now, a lot of people, you know, and people pray, people are praying on that, you know, because this is what everybody thinks. Oh, it's a spaceship. So what they do is they generate, they make a spaceship, from a computer and they put it on YouTube and this guy every time somebody clicks to see that video this person's getting paid dude and that's all he cares about is getting paid and that's what a lot of these other researchers out here is getting paid a lot of researchers won't even do an interview without getting paid i mean yeah, they're just in it for the money for the books they're not in it you know to get real information out because I believe that they don't know what they're talking about. Okay. They haven't seen it. All right. I, I am not, I have not once in all the 20 years research, I have not once gotten any money from anything I have done. And matter of fact, I don't even get any, any proceeds from the book that I'm receiving. I told the publishers to give my portions of the book to the foster kids here in Phoenix. So I'm not in it for the money. I'm not in it for the fame. I'm in it to look to to teach people look i'm seeing something out here you can see it also nobody taught me anything on what i'm doing here but it's working for some reason and if i can do it so can you and here is how to do it now and I, basically if you can't come to the mountain physically then i bring the mountain to you through my book now my book is huge all right it took me 15 years to put it together another five to six years to find a publisher that, that will work with me on getting it together. The publisher said, look, because I wrote it up into like kind of two parts. One is the lost history of Phoenix with all the proof and, and photographs and evidence, okay, of the lost history of Phoenix and, and what the Phoenix lights is and what these UFOs really are and uh, what the petroglyphs mean. And then the second part of the book goes in to how to see these UFOs, where to see them here in Phoenix, how to predict where they're going to be at, where they're not going to be at. Okay. So I, I have, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, uh, um, it's like a, not really a, a secret, but it's a pattern. It's like a secret pattern on where to see these things, how to see them, what months. All right. Cause I get a lot of people coming up to me, dude, I was up on South Mountain. I didn't see anything. Okay. What month did you go? What season? What time of day? This all this all adds up to it. That's why when you film something real in the sky, make sure when you post it or when you send it, you 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 do your data on it. You put the time and dates on it. Okay, so because that's crucial. All right, that's important. And uh, so yeah, you know, um, I'm not thinking that these things are crafts. Um, I've seen these things from my own eyes. I must have about 900 sightings already. And uh, I can tell you without a shadow of doubt, you know, if, if, if these were crafts, I'd be saying crafts, dude. I went into this thinking 
that the 1997 Phoenix Lights was this big spaceship that went over the valley, but yet I can't find any evidence of this, okay? You would think that thousands of people reported seeing this thing. Even the governor, Five Simon, is in, later came out and says, oh, I saw this crap, but yet not one person can pick up a camera. What is up with that? But only four people, four people, four credible videos of what really happened that night was lights on the west side and they didn't go over the they didn't go over the city. Okay. They stayed motionless right there on the side of the on the side of the South Mountain there. Another energy spot. Okay. I don't find any credible evidence. It's all hearsay of some spaceship going over Phoenix. And you know, like I said earlier, if something like this and, and they're saying it only went, what, eight miles an hour? Come on, dude, that's plenty of time to grab a camera. This is 1997. Yep. There were cameras back then. Even the Indians, dude, they didn't have carvings, but they carved what they saw. But yet we don't see any evidence of a massive craft going over Phoenix, Arizona. And until we do, until we do, I'm not convinced that one did. What I am convinced of, because I have seen these lights for myself, I know what they are doing. I know the hot spots out here in Phoenix, Arizona. I've been watching these things for years, and they're over there on the mountains. They're following the they're following the energy lines. They're following the sun. They're tracking the sun, okay, and they're tracking the energy throughout the world. All right. This is the reason why you know some places get sightings, other places don't get sightings. You know, because they're following, they're they're after the fault line. Well, what energy? What energy do you think that they're trying to search for in our world, particularly? Is it a spiritual energy? Is it like radioactive energy or electrical energy? You know, is it, is it something? Do you think that we're it's a man-made energy being produced, or is it something more along the line of the spiritual, religious side when it comes to maybe spirits and souls? I think um, you know, right now, um, you know, th these things have always been here. All right. And what a lot of people don't realize yet is these things live here. This is their world too. They're not from another planet. They were here before us, man. All right. They were cast down. They were thrown out. All right. Boom. This is their planet also. All right. And every time, you know, mankind needs help to survive, these things are here. All right. So we're getting ready to enter this fifth world. All right. So these things are showing up now, especially every time when we go to war or every time, you know, we're thinking about going to war, you know, these things really make a presence known. We had the food fighters back in World War II. We had other sightings back in World War I. Each, each country thought it was some kind of secret, you know, uh, spy mission going on. And that wasn't the case. It was these things waiting, waiting for mankind to need them once again, because they know, they know eventually we're going to have this big war and two thirds of the world is going to be destroyed, you know, according to prophecy according to what's really going on here. And uh, so they're waiting until mankind needs them again. You're really blowing my mind right now, Jeff, because now yeah. you got me leading on to another solid question following up with that. You referred to something, you know, back about World War One and World War Two, and these, be these, the these beings being almost like a, a part of it or a helping hand or even just being, you know, <clears throat> like you know, the, the, the stealthy ninja in the, bat in the night throwing ninja stars, whatever you want to call it. You know, it, it sounds, <laughs> it's really starting to sound to me like you're saying that these are casted, they're, they're casted down. Are you saying, you know, and I know you said earlier in the conversation about throwing out the, 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 <clears throat> the religious aspect of the Bible and you take it at face value, but are you also saying now that, you know, what's being casted down to us and that they've always been here? Well, I'm, 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 I'm kind of curious in that. And are you saying that they're here to help us? Or are they here to kind of help maintain the balance in the world if they're only showing up during times of war or, or hardship? Well, the Native Americans, they believe in all one creator. You know, we call them God. Uh, Sumerians call them a different, different name. You know, each religion or each uh, setting, each tablet describes a supreme being as a, a different name. But they all basically go on one god that created everything and um so when you look at the history okay so let's look let's go back to the history of the hokam hokam are the people words for the people who are missing the people who are gone and what happened and this didn't just happen to the hokam 
This happened to other tribes around the world at the same time who were here one day and gone the next without a trace, boom, vanished, gone. What happened to you? Happened at the same time. Okay. So the oral tradition here in Phoenix and what the petroglyphs talk about is that they worship these things in the sky as gods. They perform sacrifice much like what we see over there in, in, in Mexico. Matter of fact, the Mayans were here. I find evidence of the Mayans through the carvings and through other evidence that the Mayans were here in Phoenix. Okay, and this lasted for a thousand years until one day, one day, things went sour. And the Native Americans here who will talk to you about this, who really understand this, say that the devil came from the east and took these people away. Now, there were survivors to this Holocaust, and they hid in caves, and they were afraid. Right? They knew they were watching what was going on. Their people being carried off in the sky never to return. Right? They were terrified until it was all over with. They, they buried all their gold. They buried all their stuff in the caves here in Phoenix, Arizona, on the mountains here. All right? And they got the heck out of Dodge. They left this valley, and they put a curse on this valley. And they knew that if someone else, if their tribe was going to continue to live in this valley, then eventually they would have to go back to war with the spirits of the earth and sky. So they all took off and, and headed back to Mexico. All right. Now, for 400 years, there were tribes living on the outskirts of Phoenix, and they saw the Phoenix lights. They saw the flying snakes. They, they saw the flying orbs. They were afraid. They were terrified. They did not step one iota step into this valley until later you know when jack swelling came around and he looked at the land you know and he thought hey this is great for farmland and it started all over again they saw the indian holocom canals which was the best holocoms in the world at that time and he says hey this is great for farmland so it's it started all over again and totally totally dismissing what the indians are saying like everybody does just like you know what the religions you know, oh, well, no, that's just a story. That's just a myth. But what if, what if they were telling the truth? What made these people afraid for 400 years? Why wouldn't they live here in perfect soil to grow crops and to live back in these whole calm ruins in these houses? Why? Why, would, why wouldn't they want to live there? Because they knew. They knew that this land was cursed. This land was cursed by the spirits, by you the fallen too, ones. Child. You just you just beat me to it. That was actually my, my next question to you here. Do you is it Paulo? Obviously, you're telling me that the the area that you're in it has a very rich history with like Native Americans. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. So my my question to you then is, do you think there's any type of correlation between what you're seeing? in the skies and what you believe is what you see in the skies versus the <clears throat> versus what the native Americans used to do and what the shamans were also involved with uh, when it maybe come came to invoking and talking to spirits and possibly the curses that they put upon the land th throughout throughout the entire history they they started meeting the original immigrants you know that came from across the from the great lakes you know the great you know the great water do you think there's any type of correlation between what you're talking about and, and, and that, you know, almost taboo topic of the Native Americans prior to the, you know, to the white man showing up to, to America? Right. Um, yeah, I do. You know, when, when we're looking at these lights, when we're looking at the Phoenix lights, when we're looking at an orb in the sky, you know, in my opinion, these things don't die. They're the exact same ones that the Holocons at the Indians thousands of years ago were seeing back in the day. You know, these are exact same beings. These are, these, these are the exact same entity, all right? So you have to look back at the history. Now, the Holocons dealt, interacted with these entities because they needed them to survive, but it led to their downfall. You see where I'm going with this? They follow these things. They worship these things as gods, but at the end, they were taken away with no trace. So now these things are back and they're waiting for mankind to need them once again. This is the biggest conspiracy of the earth 
of all time, in, in my opinion, that these things are real. They have always been here. And the government and everybody else has been covering this knowledge up because this is a scary thing. This is not aliens coming down to help us. These are entities here to conquer us, to worship these things as gods once again. And you can find the same stories in biblical texts, in the Sumerian texts, and all over the world, okay, of the same story. Now, you got to ask yourself, how are different tribes around the world with no, uh, no way of contacting each other, that don't even know that the other tribe exists on the other side of the world, but they're telling the same stories, okay? They're erecting pyramids. Why? Okay, they're doing this, and they're doing that, and, and they're telling the same stories about the flood, about creation, and about all this stuff, these things in the sky, you know, the flying dragons, things like this, right? It's not folklore. This is true. This is real, okay? So these things are they're coming back, man. They know, they know that we're probably going to have a big war soon. And two-thirds of the earth will be destroyed. So, okay, now this is you, what I think. So real quick, so you mentioned, you mentioned about, you know, the government, you know, I want to kind of touch base on that. Obviously, if you're able to find this, you know, these entities, you're, you know, and all possess all this information. Do you believe that the government also knows about it? And if they do, why oh, do you yeah. have it even Absolutely. spoken to the public about it? Oh, yeah, man. They were watching these things way before I came around. Okay, so, you know, I was watching these things in 2004. I was watching the airplanes. When I made the news, after I made the news, those airplanes would follow me and my son and my friend from my apartment to Mesa Community College, sat there, watched this hook up, watch us get our cameras ready, go, and then those airplanes went up into the sky, and, and I filmed them, the lights were here, and then when my son and my friend went back, uh, to went back home the airplanes followed us home okay so when i moved in 2005 to the mountain on the east side i was no longer dealing with airplanes but black helicopters okay yes black helicopters was out and i filmed all of this all right these black helicopters would come around either right before a sighting or right after a sighting. Now, I think they know. They know when energy is about to build up. I had this one airplane, and I can't wait till my second book comes out because I got photographs of this thing. And there's an airplane with like this bubble on the bottom of it. All right. And I believe that when, because it says, you know, when the sun gets in the right position, it opens up these portholes, these doorways, and it's like a type of fusion effect. Okay, and I think that's what these ent entities are drawn to. You know, they're kind of feeding off this fusion effect energy, if you will. And they're attracted to this. And I think if you have this special technology, you might be able to see that or see that start to build. You'll see a bunch of uh, energy build in this one little area of South Mountain. And, you know, so I've seen these helicopters and these airplanes go right to this spot. Okay, and they'll circle there. That helicopter will sit there, or that airplane will sit there and wait. Okay, and for like 15, 20 minutes, and then the thing would leave. And then what had happened? I mean, one of those entities would come out of that spot or would come into that spot right after those uh, helicopters and planes left. So, yeah, you know, these things, um, the, the, the government or whoever is watching this have been watching these things a long time. And, you know, if you really, if you ask me, I think um, I think somebody knew I was coming. I mean, way before I was doing this, okay, this is a little secret. I don't know if I put it in my book or not. But, um, you know, before I was doing this, before I discovered all this, I had a black helicopter sitting right in front of me one day. I was coming wow. out of the store. And he was about maybe, oh, maybe about a half a mile away. He was eye level to me, just hovering off the ground. All right. And it was so loud and so big. And he was staring right at me. And as soon as I started to walk towards him, he took off. He got out of Dodge real quick. OK, now this is way before I started, you know, doing my investigation. And uh, so I think I think somebody knew I was coming. Uh, like I said before, I was I was seeing these UFOs when I was a kid. So this is I guess you could say this is my my destiny. This is what I'm here to, to do. And uh, somebody knows that I was coming and was going to um, uh, uh, 
bring forth this information again, so much of which they have, you know, tried to deny and um, dismiss. But yeah, I found all the evidence in the library to back up everything. Sent, who do you think sent it? Sent what? The helicopter? Well, my question really is, is these entities that are in the sky, um, would you say that they could possibly be like the fallen coming down to cause an apocalyptic kind of scene and maybe the government and maybe they were they, they're coming down and do you think it is possible that the government is not revealing this information and that they're like you kind of see like the helicopter and you know you kind of feel like they're kind of keeping tabs on you do you feel like in a sense they're trying to not let the people be aware that an apocalyptic kind of scene is going to start happening, so they're trying to cover it up. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, that's what I've been saying all along. Here is is that's why that's what we started. You know, with the show, we we started with these things were thrown down. They live here. Okay, this is. Biblical stuff. This is what we're dealing with. This is a public apocalypse type stuff that we're dealing with here. And yes, the government doesn't want us to know that you know a supreme being uh, does exist, and these things are are uh, uh, some of his angels. Because some of the when you when you read the Bible, when you read some of these biblical scrolls, they tell you they tell you you know that these angels you know are in the sky. Some of them are good and some of them, some of them are bad, okay? And, uh, you know, ex good explanation, the one that I always like to tell was Moses, okay? So when Moses was leading his people out of Egypt, you know, it clearly tells you that a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night led these uh, people out of Egypt and, uh, and basically followed them around in the desert or they followed this thing in the sky around in the desert for 40 years. All right, so basically, they're following a UFO to us, uh, the presence of God to them, but a UFO to us. And uh, who was it? Who was it that brought people into the promised land? It wasn't Moses. Moses got taken away on a mountain by a light. Was it a Phoenix light? But it says it was a light that took Moses up. And it was that, it was that thing in the sky that led uh, the people into the promised land. So tons of evidence that these things are here and as far as you know the government um i think i i think i, I understood your question uh correctly uh are they trying to stop me well you know i mean sure i guess there there is men in black if you're gonna go storm area 51 you oh know God, you that, gotta, that was a <laughs> that was the question I was going to ask you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so if you're going to do some crazy stuff like that, sure, why not? Sure, the, the government's going to come and mess with you. But, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, uh, I've been watching them. I've been on the mountain. You know, as far as anything, and I've documented all this, I've filmed them, I've, I've videotaped them. You know, yes, the, the airplanes, they, they watch what's going on. And then the airplanes... When they see someone else watching, they start watching the watchers. So they're they're watching the other people who's watching these things going on. So they're not if if they were gonna come invade and 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 come into my house and take my stuff, you know, all my evidence. I mean, that would just make everything that I'm doing credible. I mean, even more credible. You know, oh, he's onto something. You know, that's why the government went in there and got rid of him and took him out. You know, but no, that that's not the way they do it. In some countries, it is illegal to make contact with so-called extraterrestrials, but not here in the United States. So basically, the, the government knows that, you know, these things are here. They've been watching them a hell of a lot longer than I have, okay? I'm just new to this picture as far as they are concerned. Now, all they're doing is watching me. They're watching me to see how far I get with them, to see how... To just to see, because, you know, this is this is new. They, they've never really, you know, had someone such as myself actually talking to these things and having these things respond to them and coming around them. You know, they've this is, I'm, I'm a specimen 
I'm a specimen to them. They were watching to see how close I get to them, what footage I get, you know. And, uh, you know, as soon as, soon as these things start coming around my house, you know, those, those airplanes really start to gather around my house. They'll circle, you know, uh, you won't see any black helicopters around here, only on the mountains. But what you do see here is white airplanes, white Cessnas. And they'll, they'll stick around and they'll try to shoo these things away, trying to get them out of the area. But hey, they don't fuck with me. You know, Jeff, I, I've seen... Go ahead. Real quick. Uh, so do you think this whole UFO uh, alien little green men agenda, do you think it's ultimately being pushed by the government to keep people's eyes away from our thoughts and eyes away from them being actual entities rather than UFOs? Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Man, that's, you that's you are great. absolutely blowing my mind. This is my first time I've <laughs> ever heard of them actually being entities, and all the stuff you're saying is just it's all kind of clicking and coming together for me. And I don't, I, Donnie, Kate, is it same thing happening to you over there? Because I'm like kind of blown <clears throat> away. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing all the research that you know you've done and. Um, and that you know you you donate your everything and I, I don't know you've just been blowing my mind of how much research you've done and how much you found and the evidence that you have and um, you, you make very good points. Um, I I think that you know what you're saying is pretty spot on. It's 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 definitely something that people need to know and I thank you for bringing this to our attention um, and telling all of our listeners about, you know, everything that you've discovered, because a lot of us don't know about it. And maybe now that it kind of opens our eyes, maybe there could be a better outcome. Because if people start realizing what they really are, maybe things could change. Maybe there could be some kind of good that would come from yeah. everyone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, um, I was the first one to bring this to the UFO community uh, when I first found out about all this in 2005. Um, you know, I, going into this, I'm thinking spaceships coming, you know, dealing with this and not really coming out of it, but understanding it, I, I, I totally flipped on this. You know, I see it for what it really is. And I, I've done, the, I, I did, I wrote an article for UFO magazine, which in turn came into the pilot for the UFO Hunter show and also the pilot for the ancient aliens. And uh, in 2007, when the UFO Hunter show finally aired on the history channel, they came back out to, to do a, a real um, show on me. And they were telling me, they were telling me, Jeff, dude, you're filming some bizarre stuff. They're saying that the, the public is not ready for this type of UFO. If you're going to talk about these things, you need to say spaceships. You need to say crafts, okay, because the public is not ready for this. Now, this was back in 2007, and I was really upset about that. I'm like, dude, come on. You know, this is, this is something completely new. You know, no one has ever, has ever in the history of, of the United States has successfully matched the UFOs to the petroglyphs out here. Oh, we think it was a theory back in the day. Oh, yeah, we think that the Native Americans saw, you know, UFOs in the sky and recorded it. But no one has actually taken the time to watch a mountain for three and a half years the way I did and study this mountain and, and continue to hike and understand everything and see them and actually matched it, you know, to the petroglyphs. No one's ever done that before. You know, and also, I was the first one here in the United States to actually say, look, man, it's not crafts. Sure, there might be crafts out there. We're not to get it. Okay, I got an open mind to it. But what we're basically seeing out here is something different, man. This, this, these, these things are alive, all right? They're creatures. Some would say that they're monsters, all right? They're, they're entities, okay? They're, they're not little guys on a spaceship. It's not technology that we're dealing with here. It's another higher power. Okay, these things are a little bit higher than man because we always thought, oh, man is the most significant here on planet Earth. No, man, there's something else, dude. And it's called these things in the sky. The Bible calls them angels. The Bible calls them fallen angels. The Bible calls them Nephilim. Okay, this is what's going on here, in my opinion. 
man, awesome. That's that's. that's man. Go ahead, Donnie. So, I guess I guess my biggest my biggest question to you at this point is we talk we talk about the gov we talk about the government obviously knowing about this going far back as World War One World War Two, you know obviously these entities aren't afraid truly to, to reveal themselves. Obviously they travel freely amongst the, you know, the, the space continuum, whether it be within our atmosphere, with, you know, whether in the confines of space, whatever, whatever it is, they freely move about. <clears throat> you know, you mentioned earlier on in our conversations here with you um, about seeing the potter, you know, the pottery, uh, you know, pots you know, of clay being broken uh, for sacrifices, were you know th were there any other type of artifacts that were found you know maybe something like you know a sacrificial blade like a erotic cube or any type of you know totem pole whatsoever to to, to even get like, any type of sort of communications to, with with us as humans versus these entities was there anything there like solid evidence wise to kind of help support the you know, the the relationship that was built way back before any of this was ever discovered and brought to our attention. Um, well, yeah, just a second. Uh, uh, yeah, um, um, you know, we can, we can find the altars. We can find the altars on South Mountain. So we know that they were sacrificed. We can find the tombs that were carved out there. Uh, that were chiseled out inside uh, Pyramid Hill, Pyramid Mountain Hills, all right? Um, you know, but other things, other artifacts, yes, if you go higher, higher up on the mountain, um, you, can, you can find, you know, uh, significant, uh, I guess you could say, artifacts, but you're not allowed to take any. It's a government mountain now. And this is the reason why it's like we're, we're not allowed to... Um, uh, you know, enter any of these tombs. So this is why I, this is why I, I took photographs of these tombs and I put it in the book. And there's other things in the book there that the reader can look at, you know, and decide for himself. Uh, we won't go into that today. But yeah, the book is is full of knowledge, full of photographs, and um, and you know, there has been so many people in the last couple of hundred years living here in the valley. You know, things are have gotten destroyed. Things have already been picked up. You know, as a matter of fact, I can't even find a good arrowhead here in South, on South Mountain. And I think it's because, you know, all the Boy Scouts, all the Boy Scouts has, has picked them all up. You know, so there's been a lot of people tracking here, living here, and picking up things, taking it home. There's even people uh, chiseling away petroglyphs. I don't know if it's the government. Trying, trying to hide the story, trying to cover up the story, or if it's somebody else, you know, chiseling out the petroglyph to take it home as a souvenir to hang on the wall, you know. But um, there's, there's evidence, man. If you go look for it as much as I have, and I found it. Go look, and you shall find. And buddy, I found it. I found it. I found it. I documented it, brother. It's there. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we're reaching about the hour, 10 minute mark. So we're going to wrap it up. I just want to thank you, Jeff, for joining us today. And uh, is where can all the listeners find you at? Oh, you can to... find me on my... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you ahead. can find me on my, on my Facebook page, Jeff Woolwine, Petroglyphs in the Sky. It's all one word. There you can find a link to my website that goes into a little bit more detail, goes into some of the sightings. Um, you can find uh, uh, my book there, uh, The Phoenix Lights, Petroglyphs in the Sky, uh, True Stories, Miss Legends, and UFOs over Phoenix, Arizona. And that book right there is the first novel, and that basically goes into the lost history of Phoenix. It reads like a movie, so it, it teaches the reader what is actually the, the history of Phoenix, Arizona, not being told by the archaeologist. The archaeologist wants us to to think that these people, the whole cons was just a peace loving race. And that basically wasn't it, man. There, you know, so there's evidence to suggest that there's a lot more to the whole com. And I bring this in, in with the book uh, and I show photographs. And like I said, if you can't get to the mountain, I bring the mountain to you. 
And you can follow me on my Facebook page. Um, I'm doing my own uh, uh, video show now, so you can follow my stuff there and, and uh, you can see some of the new stuff that I'm doing. Awesome. Well, I appreciate uh, you joining us again today and taking your time out and enlightening us and just absolutely blowing my mind. Uh, I'm sure Donnie, Kate's, and Dan's mind. Um, absolutely amazing time, Jeff. Like I, I can't like express to you how amazing this entire conversation has been to me. And you know, you bring a lot of things to light that I actually believe in, and I don't really discuss with a lot of people because a lot of people also believe I'm really out of this world with the with my with my beliefs. Um, but no, you really resonated with me today, and uh, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time, you know, out of your day to come speak with us and, you know, it, you ex be able to express yourself freely and pass on some very, very handy knowledge that I believe not just we here at Theory of the Third Kind will definitely take away, uh, but I think a lot of these listeners now might have actually had the veil lifted for them as well. Well, I really appreciate you guys having me on, and I'm honored to be here, and, and thank you so much, man. You guys rock. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so I want to thank everybody today for joining us and listening to us again at theories of the third kind if you want to contact or email any of us you can go to theories of the third kind.com or tot3k.com there you can click on contact and you will find individual emails to each one of us or you can just use the contact button and send a mass email to all of us you can also leave us a voicemail if you would like we feature all voicemails each week uh, when we record so you just click the voicemail button. You can do it by phone, potato, or website and record any message you want. You can send it anonymously. Um, there you will also, on our website, you will also find all of our episodes as well as links to all of our podcast directories. If you want to leave us five-star reviews on there, that would be excellent. No pressure, though. Yeah, come on now. Give us that five-star review. Yep. Um, and we all... Yeah, so we read all five-star reviews. Uh, that's just, you know, if you want to put something in there, just leave it. Anyways, uh, again, thank everybody for joining us today. And make sure to check us out on social media as well. So that's about it. So, Donnie, Kate, you want to lead us out? You already know. All right, guys, remember, it's okay to be out of this world with your thoughts. Because you're not alone.